Hello, welcome once again to From Caracas. I'm Laura Prada and in this opportunity we'll be talking with Rodrigo Vázquez, an Argentinian filmmaker who is presenting his most recent work, Palestine Stolen Images. Welcome, Rodrigo. Thank you for having me. How does a Latin American inter interest on, on showing the people's struggles around the world? Well, possibly because uh, I was born in Argentina in 1969 and by the time of the military coup in 1976 I started going to school and the violence in the street was quite apparent. I have memories from that time that I revisited in Palestine many many years later. So maybe because I was marked by violence from when I was a child by memories of violence Although I was from a middle class background, violence was uh, widespread, ever present. And um, if you were a child, it was difficult not to be affected by it. So possibly because of that, because of being marked by violence early on, I got interested in documentary making. And uh, I ended up going to England to uh, study documentary making. And uh, I started working. Uh, my first job was for the BBC World. I went to the Amazon rainforest to make a film about Chico Mendes, the, uh, the um, assassinated environmentalist. And uh, after that, I did a, you know, a few jobs in Latin America, including the, uh, a film about uh, the caravan of death, the investigation of the caravan of death by the uh, Judge Guzman, the Pinochet case. And after that, I was asked to start on a new series as a filmmaker. So um, I was sent to Bolivia first in the year 2001 uh, during the indigenous insurrections mm -hmm. when Tuto Quiroga, the vice president of former dictator Hugo Banzer, was in power. And after that, um, I was proposed to go to the Gaza Strip. That was right after September the 11th, 2001, after the attacks in New York and Washington. The idea being that we would report on what was going on in the Gaza Strip while the American army was invading Afghanistan and the eyes of the world were focused there. Why, why you found interesting to uh, put into a documentary what was happening there? Because uh, I thought that the world had to see what was going on while the world was watching Afghanistan and the Americans supposedly avenging the attacks in New York and Washington um, in Palestine, the Israeli army was able to undertake operations against the National Liberation Movement, particularly in the Gaza Strip, while the world was watching Afghanistan. So we thought we had a duty to observe and report what was not being reported by the mainstream media and we did and in effect we ended up being in the second day of our trip under aerial bombardment I was staying next to Arafat's compound in the Gaza Strip and in the morning uh, four Apache helicopters came to the coast and started pounding the compound I'd never filmed aerial bombardment before. And Is that what uh, part of the images, part of those stolen images that yes. can be seen on the on Palestine stolen images? That's right. It was my first, my first memory of that place when I visited the uh, footage to make the film was, was connected to that day, to what I felt that day. I mean, the very, very first image that I shot in Gaza is in the film which is this um, martyr who was being uh, paraded uh, before his funeral in the Gaza Strip. Osama Heles was his name. And, uh, and I filmed that. And then the day after, probably as a retaliation to the, uh, the operation in which Osama Heles died, there was this aerial bomb bombardment. Yeah, so... Um, so basically, I shot um, the funeral, the bombardment. I was panicked, obviously, because I wasn't trained to, to film. Were you conscious of uh, 
what you were filming in that moment? Of course, I was, um, of course. I mean, I had to make a sequence of, out of it. You know how it is when you're, I'm, I'm my own cameraman. So um, I was shooting everything. I was trying to um, design the scene, thinking of what was going on while shooting it and editing it in my head at the same time, as you do when you're on your own shooting. I was with a journalist there. Um, so I was not only appreciating the reality, but also trying to organize it in my frame so that I could tell the, uh, the story using, you know, different shots and sequences and stuff. So yes, I was very aware of what was going on. That's why I was so afraid. Obviously, I was very, very afraid. And when the helicopters came to the coast and they started bombing, we ran downstairs to the hotel lobby. We saw that the, uh, the waiters there were just like laughing and pointing at the, at the helicopters. It was natural for them. It wasn't natural for me or for the reporter to be witnessing that kind of violence. But we naturalized it very, very soon, very fast. You know, because the, the next day, while the first day we ran away from the bombs, the second day we saw the jets pounding the center of the Gaza Strip and we decided to go right in to the place that was being bombarded. It was in the middle of the city at midday. It was full of people. We couldn't believe that such a thing was going on while you know, life was going on around. You know? And actually, the jets were pounding. The people were still you know, shopping and strolling by and doing their daily things. And it was quite schizophrenic in a way because uh, something extraordinary was going on. But people, that was people's everyday life. That's what struck me first. And in a way, it calmed me down because I saw that the people were going about their daily lives. I was doing my work. And, and in a way, I integrated that extraordinary violence as a fact of life, like they do. Is that uh, all uh, on, the, on the documentary? How do you get to the inspiration to make this documentary? Well, you know, when you go to the Gaza Strip, your life changes if you are connected to what's going on there. If you are connected to man's inhumanity to man, like, you know, you witness in, in Palestine. Um, I guess that was a job, you know, uh, that I was doing, but I was filming with people, with victims, with children who were injured in that attack because the Israeli jets were bombing the middle of the Gaza Strip, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. And obviously, most of the victims are women and children. I was outraged by the sight of children with, you know, injured children and their parents. I had just become a parent myself. Uh, my daughter was only four months old, so I was very sensitive to the suffering of children and to the plight of parents whose children had been injured and I was touched, deeply touched by that. The fourth day I was in the Gaza Strip, and this is not in the film, um, we were in a school, in an UNRWA school, you know, the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency school, um, in uh, an English class and uh, we were basically filming the class and suddenly there was the shooting started outside and people, you know, obviously around panicked and the children, they all started to cry and shout and they, and they basically went to the floor to get away from the bullets and I found myself dropping to the floor and when I was doing that I had a flashback of a memory that I, I didn't know that I had from when I was five years old, 1975, in my kindergarten, I had a flash of my teachers and my classmates on the floor while they were shooting outside. Just like that day in the Gaza Strip, I had completely eradicated this memory and it came back to me. I was going through that in the Gaza Strip 30 odd years later. Uh, and I connected these two things. My own memory of violence in Argentina from 1975, when the paramilitary groups decided to execute three militants outside my kindergarten, and what was going on that day of 2001 in the Gaza Strip, and the terror in the children's faces. And that was seared into my memory. I, I, I was never 
able to forget that. But that day, I got um, to understand the deep connection that I had to violence and to this place that had to do with my, uh, with my experience and how I, I was able to connect to people. Because in a way, you know, violence had marked my childhood too and, and my life as a result of you know, living in Argentina under the dictatorship. Is because of that ex life experience why also you were touched by this story? And about that, uh, Telesur has been displaying the documentary. Which similarities can the Latin American audience see between the Palestinian situation and the actual and the past situation that Latin America lived with those um, dictatorships? Well, the existence of uh, a conflict in the Middle East, not only in Palestine, but also in Lebanon, has to do with the colonization of European powers of the Middle East, the decolonization process that took place after the Second World War, and you know, the resulting ensuing violence. Um, in the case of Palestine, the failed retreat of the British uh, Empire, not only in Palestine, but including Palestine, uh, resulted in the suffering, the massive suffering, f you know, since then, of the Palestinian people who lived there. And uh, likewise, the, res you know, the dictatorship in South America, the dictatorships in all of our countries were related to neocolonialism and, you know, imperial interests that pushed uh, the military to take over power to stop the spread of national liberation movements, uh, of communism, as they called it, uh, of socialism, you know. Um, so what we had in common was the fact that violence in our countries existed because of colonialism and uh, imperialist actions in our, in our countries, uh, that, you know, middle class people like me integrated as a fact of life. Of course, we have to fight against communism. Of course, that this is, it's okay for the military to take over. Like, you know, most people say, of course, Israelis have to attack Palestinians because of the terrorist groups. Just like in Argentina, the National Liberation Movement was denominated like terrorist, terrorist movement. In the Middle East, the same thing happened and happens. So the deep connection had to do with history. Uh, our history, has to do with imperialism, the fight against it, and the price we pay for it. And that's the deep connection we have between the Middle East and South America. The existence of a middle class that associates itself to imperial powers, both in Palestine and in Latin America. And, you know, the struggle against imperialism is what united us. But also a sense of being um, of pushing for our independence, our autonomy, our, our ability to be free, to decide for ourselves, the self-determination of our people, which is what we were fighting for in the 70s and 80s in South America, which is what they are fighting, the Palestinians are fighting for right now in Palestine. That's a deep connection, not only culturally, because we are you know, warm, welcoming people with a huge sense of family and community, uh, and our deep connection, a deep connection to history. Um, so that was a connection, really. Not only the personal, but historically there was a connection. That's why the uh, 1960s, 70s filmmakers who'd gone to Jordan had entitled their film Palestine, Another Vietnam. Because like in Vietnam, the people were also struggling against a, an imperialist government or state and struggling for their freedom. How did you access to the images, the, the uh, archive images that you also used in the documentary? Well, um, in 2011, I went to the Icaic Film Archive and I started searching for works made by Latin Americans in Palestine. Wait, what is Icaic? Icaic is a Cuban Film Institute, uh, a venerable institution that was a symbol of the revolution for many, many years, um, that produced films around the world showing the other side of the imperialist version of history. 
Um, so lots of left-wing films were made then, were uh, in the 60s and 70s by the ICAIC, the Cuban Film Institute. And also, this place became a, um, uh, like a haven for films that were made in other places in South America that after the dictatorships started had to be shipped out and uh, taken somewhere for preservation. So many of the films were taken to Cuba and one of them was this film, Palestine and Other Vietnam, that I discovered there um, and that was later, later restored and sent back to Argentina. Um, so the archive comes from that film and from other films like the films made, made by Santiago Álvarez, uh, an iconic uh, Cuban documentary maker. Uh, 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of his birth, actually. And he had made films and newsreels that connected the Latin American struggle to the struggle for freedom in the Middle East. And uh, so I, we you know, partnered up with the uh, Cuban Film Institute to be able to use the archive footage in the film and uh, reflect on this connection between Latin America and the Middle East. About that connection, you also have other documentaries like Operación uh, Condor, The Axis of Evil, Evil yeah. and uh, other documentaries. How, how do you see you balance this um, history, recent history, in those documentaries and how you can move audience towards um, analyzing, towards making conscious on them about what's going on today in not only Latin America and the Middle East but in the world. Yes, it's, uh, it's always a struggle to try to get uh, people to remember to, um, to use memory uh, and l learn from history, not to repeat the same mistakes. Unfortunately, I had to say that it seems like every generation has to learn again and make again the same mistakes that were made before because it doesn't seem to be enough to just have filmmakers and historians and you know, writers reflecting on history. It's difficult for people to realize about, you know, a re, you know, take in history if they have not suffered in the present tense something, you know, and if they have not learned it by themselves, right? So the idea is that we, sh we shouldn't need to do that. In the case of the Holocaust, you know, uh, and the, the, the genocide of the Jewish people has been turned into this um, mass media operation for this phenomenon not to ever happen to the Jewish people again, which I completely agree with. I think genocide should not be suffered by any people on earth. And luckily, this lack of learning from history has determined that today, the Israeli state has not only become an apartheid state, just like South Africa was, but they are applying to the Palestinian people some of the treatment that was applied to them by the Nazis. And only stating this is a scandal in many circles. They always say it's impossible to, to compare the genocides in, in the Nazi Germany and in Poland to what's going on in the Middle East or to what was going on in, in South America in the 60s and 70s. But I have to say that if you look at how genocide is typified, you see that what happened in the 60s and 70s was genocide. What happens in Palestine today is genocide. What happened in Nazi Germany was genocide. And the inability of us to connect these three things determines that we repeat history. That's why today in Brazil we have a neo-fascist government about to take over that is keen, keen on, on, on calling just a, you know, a movement, a workers' movement like the Workers' Party, a uh, communist. Um, you know, this means that we have, they have learned nothing from history, that history is not properly worked on, reflected on, and our job is to fill the, the vacuum there, to connect what's happened before to what's happening now so that we illuminate action to prevent the same mistakes from happening again. So 
we almost are running out of time, but I wanted to I want to know before um, we end on uh, on which projects you're working currently, and if in that those projects you have thought about also uh, talking about Africa, because as you know, Telesur English is also set out for Africa and other regions of the world. How how do you feel about, for example, talking about what happened in Africa? Well, it's very important. You know, uh, Alge Al Algeria was a key place for the Cuban Revolution to make a base and connect with the struggle in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, so the National Liberation Fr Front in Algeria was very important, a uh, very important ally. You know, today what's going on in Northern Africa is also a, a result of neocolonization. And the occupation of Middle Eastern countries, North African countries, by regimes that are not, are not serving the people is, in a way, a consequence of our inability to reflect on history, of, uh, to organize ourselves so that we come up with uh, sustainable ways of uh, self-determination. So it's very important to work in North Africa, to reflect on what's going on there, and to connect it to our history here in South America and the history of the Middle East and in other places like Vietnam, why not? Mexico, what's going on in Brazil, everything is interconnected. It's our duty to connect the, the dots and to tell the story, the narrative. So what I'm working on now is still a reflection on, in a way, the deep crisis that the left is in. Um, after 15 years of, uh, of ruling South America, um, right-wing governments and ultra-right-wing governments are taking power. So my last film made for a French channel was, uh, you know, include five uh, presidents, left-wing presidents, and their, their um, self-criticism and reflections on what's going on today. Um, we're currently making a film about Venezuela and uh, the struggle of the people here. Um, and we are planning to also make a film about Santiago Álvarez for the 100th uh, anniversary of his birth because he is another internationalist filmmaker that was also seeking to connect the dots and our histories and our common narrative. Thank you, Rodrigo, for sharing with us your experience while producing this documentary, Palestine Stolen Images, and for sharing with us on your, about your future projects. Okay, thank you. Like this, we've come to an end of uh, from Caracas, and with the hope that you've enjoyed this interview. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you. Cheers.